All right, so for Christmas, you got a new Fitbit, a heart rate tracker watch. For your birthday, you got the Aura Ring. You're tracking your personal metrics. You're, you see how much you sleep and how well you sleep. And you see your heart rate during different times of the day and your resting heart rate and your max heart rate. And maybe even you've got a whoop and you're seeing heart rate variability. What does this all mean? And how can we use these tools to optimize your training? That's what we're gonna talk about today. Heart rates, really fall into about five zones. And what we do here is we measure your maximum heart rate. Now, the classical formula for figuring out your maximum heart rate is to take the number 220 and subtract your age, and that'll give you an approximation. But because you're fitter than the vast majority of people, what you're going to find is that you can get a maximum heart rate that's far above that number, and you can do it safely. So, we're going to start with 220 minus your age until we have another number. And then if you're wearing your heart rate monitor or, or your wearable watch or your aura ring or whatever, and it says something like 185 is your max heart rate, then that's the number that we'll take and we'll adjust these windows up. Basically, at different levels of heart rate, you make these metabolic changes in your body. You get different benefits from different types of exercise according to what your heart is doing. When the demand on your heart is higher, you metabolize energy differently. You'll use carbs more than fats, for example. When your heart rate is lower, you're going to get some, some small benefit, but you won't really get the value that you need to get from exercise. And so today we're gonna to talk about optimizing your training using all five zones and why they're necessary. I'll talk about where you should spend the majority of your time, and I'll talk about how we make this interesting. I'm sure that if your mom had a treadmill growing up, or a stair stepper, or you belong to the gym when you were younger, you probably stepped on a cardio machine and you saw you know, fat burning zone, cardio zone, whatever, right? There was some kind of map on the treadmill. Well, those things aren't completely false. Today, I'm gonna to tell you the truth and what the science is about heart rate training zones. So zone one, um, you're just, you're maybe walking. You know, for most of us, this would be like mowing the lawn. So our heart rate is 50% of max. If your maximum heart rate is 200, you're, you're doing about 100 beats a minute. So you're moving, but you could easily have a conversation just like this without stopping to take a deep breath. In this stage, it's good for recovery. It certainly helps with digestion, like a 30 minute walk after dinner will help you process your food better. It will improve your circulation, which can help in soft tissue healing if you've got an injury. Um, it can just make you feel better. It can brighten your mood and it allows you to stay conversational. If you're concerned about being in flow state, which is just like feeling uh, creative, feeling smart, solving problems, then this is zone one. So mowing the grass is a great example, but some people are even in zone one, like taking a shower, okay? The problem is that zone one is insufficient to create any kind of real metabolic or, or health saving benefit. And so like going shopping is zone one, but zone one is not going to create any long-term health changes or body type changes in you. If people are really, really, really out of weight or, or like overweight, or they're really, really, really out of shape, then anything is better than nothing. But the key is that even moderate, easy exercise for you is going to be harder zone two, zone three exercise for them, okay? So we're not gonna worry too much about zone one. Zone two is where things really start to get interesting though. So in zone two, which is 65 to 75% of your max heart rate, if your max heart rate is like 200, then you'd be doing about 130 beats per minute. Most of us have a max heart rate that's much lower than that. So this would probably be around 110 for a lot of people. At this stage, you feel like your heart is beating and you could have conversations, but you know, it'd be like short sentences, but you're primarily burning fat as fuel. Okay. So this is the level where you start to sweat. Your core temperature actually comes up a little bit more. Um, you know, you're probably doing it with a friend. It's maybe like a really easy jog but you're primarily able to metabolize fat, break down fat fast enough that you can convert it into energy and use it as fuel. This creates some metabolic flexibility. Like a lot of us don't burn fat because we don't have the enzymes to burn fat, or we don't burn fat because our body is used to only burning carbs. So people who run a lot, 
but they're still kind of saggy, skinny fat, this is their problem. They're never doing any zone two work. So their body only learns to burn carbs instead of fat or preferentially burns carbs or whatever. This metabolic flexibility means that your body can burn fat just as efficiently as it burns carbs. And the way that you create that metabolic efficiency is doing zone two exercise. This also helps with mitochondrial density. Now, if you think back to grade 10 science class, you might remember your teacher saying that the mitochondria are like the batteries of the cell. And the cool thing is that you can grow more mitochondria. You can also make them function better by doing this zone two exercise. This will also decrease your blood pressure. Um, even though like your blood lipid levels will probably decrease a little bit, that might have some effect, but even above that, you will decrease your blood pressure doing zone two work. There's very low injury risk. Nobody's overtraining in zone two. In fact, sometimes it can kind of feel boring if you're jogging. I like to ride my bike, but it will increase insulin sensitivity too. So if um, you have impaired insulin sensitivity, you're pre-diabetic or even type two diabetic, zone two work, will um, decrease resistance to insulin, making the muscles more hungry for blood sugar and insulin so that you can process things better, okay? This will improve your work capacity too. And a lot of that has to do with the metabolic flexibility of using fats and carbs for fuel. So carbs are an efficient source of fuel, but you can use them up pretty quickly. And if you can go back and forth between using carbs and fat really effectively, then you can work harder for longer because you, you've got diesel and you've got gas to use, right? This will also improve your top end performance, your speed, <clears throat> your sprinting, the, the stuff that's hard to maintain for long because creating a broader base means that you don't enter zone four and five until things get a little bit harder. In zone three, which is where most of us would jump to if we were like jogging, you are using fats and carbs for fuel but only if you're used, to, if you're if you're good at using fast for fuel. So if you're constantly redlining in your workouts and you're always going zone four, zone five, and you're doing like hard workouts every time you go out, your body is probably going to learn to only use carbs for fuel. And so what happens is when you're doing zone three work, you don't have that flexible metabolic flexibility to use fats and carbs, and so you just run out of gas quickly because you're only using the carbs and you're not really burning up fat stores. So zone three is a very efficient zone where you can hold like a moderate effort for a pretty long period of time if you have the metabolic flexibility to do that. For that reason, this does improve your metabolism over time. So zone three is um, it's hard enough to create metabolic demand. You have to burn off fat, but it's easy enough that you can preserve lean muscle tissue. Your body is not like catabolizing your muscle to feed itself, right? It, and so um, this is a very great zone for exercise for people, especially who want to have performance and behave like athletes. The problem is that if you're not doing zone two work, or if you're only mostly doing like zone five work, this zone won't get you very many benefits at all. It, it's not challenging enough to um, create new, new power, new speed, new strength, but it's too challenging to like preserve lean muscle tissue. And it's not, you know, it's too challenging to burn fat. Zone four, things start to get pretty tight. And at this level, you're working really hard. You're primarily burning carbs for fuel. You can't break down fast, fast enough to use them. You're generating lactic acid. So if you're doing like a CrossFit workout and it's like 50 air squats and you do 32 in two minutes or something like that, and your legs are starting to burn, you know that you're probably in zone four. The interesting thing about this though, is this will improve your cardiovascular capacity quite a bit. And um, you'll also get an amazing endorphin rush when you're done. This triggers the release of a lot of endorphins, but you'll also feel really good about the workout. So after the workout's done, you'll be like, wow, I accomplished something. You know, I, I did that very hard thing. And if you're trying to like beat a previous time at the workout or, or climb a hill faster than ever before, you're going to spend a lot of time in zone four. You're going to be challenged and that you usually enter zone four when you're trying to rise to meet a challenge or, or meet a personal best. So the, the cool part about zone four is like you only get in it when things are getting really interesting and fun. Um, 
the downside of zone four is that injury risk is coming up quite a bit. You're not really burning fat for fuel anymore. Um, even if you're on like a ketogenic diet, you're still burning you know, like carbs that are stored in your, your liver. Um, you're starting to generate a lot of lactic acid, but you do feel like you're accomplishing something. And, you know, before CrossFit, most fitness was confined to bodybuilding plus jogging or like running. And um, so nobody really got into this zone four. Everybody was into zone one, two, three. And so the value of the in intensity that we all learned from Greg Glassman and in CrossFit was getting people into this zone four and making exercise feel really, really fun, partially because of the challenge, but also introducing this level of intensity that had these like downstream effects too. All right, and then zone five is like, you are all out. <clears throat> You're improving your VO2 max. That's how much oxygen you can take up like in a very short period of time and metabolize. You can't talk, you are max. You're not gonna hold this for longer than 30 seconds, but it's awesome for stress reduction because it's so hard that you just can't focus on anything else. Like it takes up all of your mindset. Also, if you're in zone five, it's probably because you're like racing to do your best or to, um, you're racing your buddy or you're racing for the leaderboard or you're trying to set a personal best so it feels awesome because of the outcome it's also great for confidence right you learn that you can do hard things and so there's value to all of these zones the optimal prescription really depends on your goal so if we know what your goal is we can work backward and say you should spend most of your time in zone two you should spend most of your time in zone five most experts who think about health span think where do I need to spend the majority of my training time to optimize my health over my lifespan? And the answer to that question is you need mostly zone two with some zone five. So you're metabolizing fats, you're improving circulation, you're uh, decreasing your risk of type two diabetes, you're getting those, those benefits. However, you're also going hard enough to enjoy exercise, to improve your VO2 max, to preserve lean muscle tissue and build some, to increase speed and power, uh, to increase the ability to develop force, super important if you're old and trying to stand up, great for stress reduction, great for confidence, just learning I can do hard things. So how do you mix these things up in a way that's interesting? You know, the old way was to have like, you, you would have like a, a chest day at the gym and then on Tuesday was like your cardio day. So you'd go into the gym and you'd ride the bike. And then Wednesday was like back and biceps day. So you'd do a bunch of lat pull downs and curls. And then Thursday was like cardio day. So you would go into the gym and you'd walk on the treadmill. But we can make things a lot more fun and that will help you stick with an exercise program and actually get excited about exercise. And that's what a catalyst is, something that creates a reaction. We want you to have a reaction to exercise that gets you to your health goals. We are the catalyst that will start that reaction. And so we use something that's called mixed modal or multimodal interval training. This means that the workouts that we do are constantly varied, right? It's rare that you'll repeat the same workout, but we can use different methods and tools and equipment to get you into the heart rate zone that you want to be in without making you walk on a treadmill forever or do some boring elliptical trainer or recumbent bike we can use kettlebells we can use barbells we can use gymnastics rings we can use uh, sprinting and jogging to get you into the right heart rate zone and we can do it in a different way every day and we can do it with a group so it's fun and we can we can track your progress and you can compare yourself against the person you used to be and you can win. That's the key to being constantly varied. We can also make it way more fun. It is easy to push yourself to where you need to go when you're with a group of other people. And you know we know this at Catalyst, uh, CrossFit gyms know this, Peloton knows this. The value of that community really adds something to it. There's also a gamification element especially when we repeat a workout, you want to do better, right? You, you want to feel like you're progressing. And if you know that it took you 10 minutes and 12 seconds last time, you want to do it in 10 minutes flat this time. We can also measure incremental gains. So if you have a goal of losing fat, it might be depressing to see like I'm not losing a pound every single day. So it's really important to see progress in a variety of areas. So you can say like my resting heart rate went down a heartbeat. 
my bench press went up five pounds. I ran that 400 meters two seconds faster. I completed the Fran workout in under six minutes for the first time. And these small incremental gains will keep you motivated and engaged long enough to see the long-term gains that you're really after. Because those effects of the incremental gains compound over time and they all make you get closer and closer to your real big goals faster. It's also functional. So we don't have to spend time doing biceps curls and lat pull downs. We can do like a prone row or we can do a pull up or we can do other pulling motion that will get you way farther faster because the whole is more than the sum of its parts. For example, we would use a deadlift instead of using a leg curl machine, a calf raise, a hip extension, a reverse hyper and a glute ham raise. We would just deadlift. Plus you get to be awesome and strong. And finally, we can do this with goal directed behavior. So we can say, for example, like, you know, here's what you did on your back squat last week. This week we're doing more reps, but I want you to try to use, you know, a slightly heavier weight. Or we could say, uh, last time we did this workout, you did X. Or we could say, it's 7 a.m., the 6 a.m. group did this workout in X time. We can set goals for you and we can work backward to say, here's where you need to spend time in each heart rate zone to achieve your specific goal. So the heart rate zones have a broad application. The science supports, here are the different benefits, but they also have a micro application of you have a short term goal to lose 10 pounds or to get faster. Here's the heart rate zone that you should be training in. Over time, these things balance out and you'll achieve better health span by spending most of your time in zone two and zone five, but you also need to spend time in each of these other zones. The key though, is that you don't have to worry about it. We'll take care of the programming for you. Make sure that you're getting uh, constantly varied fun workouts with multimodal domains and that you're spending lots of time in each zone. Your job is just to keep showing up and do it long enough uh, that you really start to see the benefits compounding.